I want to jump into the first question, a question that I think three different people from the audience asked me on the way in, uh, and it's about insurance mergers. So to what extent are the proposed mergers of major insurers, particularly Anthem with Cigna and Aetna with Humana, a response to company-specific issues or to broader changes in healthcare financing or delivery? Who would like to take the first I could, crack at I, that? I can take a crack at it. Okay. Um, so I, I think it is definitely being catalyzed by the Affordable Care Act. There are a few company-specific factors, but it is uh, it's underpinned by some really broad trends, I think, post the Affordable Care Act. The first one I'd say is regulation, which has uh, limited the profitability for these companies to a great degree. The caps on medical loss ratio floors, the rate reviews, which really limits the pricing and underwriting that they can undertake. Secondly, I think there is also the consolidation that's occurring on the provider side of the equation. And that's an important trend that they have to respond to as a result of which I think you're seeing the consolidation that's now being undertaken in the, um, in the health insurance sector as well. And then thirdly, I say that a little bit more, it's, it's a broader healthcare overall situation. It is related to the ACA, but not specifically related to the legislation that's associated with Obamacare. We've had privatization, broadly speaking, in the Medicare and the Medicaid space. Um, Aetna, I think, is uh, largely doing this acquisition with Humana because they want to diversify away from a slowing growth commercial employer-sponsored marketplace and shore up um, their Medicare capabilities. On the Anthem Cigna side, I think the fact that we'll have the Cadillac tax in 2018, I think, is going to drive more of a mix shift from the group insurance market to individual. Cigna is not very strong in individual. Anthem does not have the, the self-insured and stop-loss capability in the smaller end of the, the group employer market. So together, um, they can bring a more complementary set of capabilities to service the entire spectrum of employers from small group to middle market, you know, all the way to, to national accounts. So I, I think it is more, you know, just in a nutshell, it's more the, the broader trends and catalyzed by the ACA than, it, than it's company specific. Yes, Matt? Maybe I, I agree with, um, with those points. I just expand on, on a few others. I think there is uh, a desire on the part of the companies to um, engage in the mergers to, to boost earnings growth, <clears throat> which they can do through recognizing cost and revenue synergies. So if you will, some, some real and uh, some paper financial engineering uh, at a time when um, regulation has made things tighter and in some areas earnings growth more challenging. Uh, relative to, to regulation, I think the increased burden of regulation has brought some regulatory economies of scale that may apply. Having said that, I'm not sure I'm not sure that that, that 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 would meaningfully change at the scale that these companies are already operating. And the last thing might be um, as a uh, perhaps a secondary rationale for the mergers, uh, the ability to uh, concentrate um, the, uh, the members or the patient lives in population-based reimbursement or risk contracts. Uh, and, what I mean here is when I think back to working in the industry in the late 90s, working with uh, provider groups that were looking to take uh, take on risk contracts, one of the challenges that we found is that we'd enter into a couple of payer contracts and that was about as far as we could go and it would represent 10% of the, the medical group's lives and that was pretty hard to change behavior or, or to get to the law of large numbers with that. So that's another another motivator. Can I just sure, add a thought? Sure. Um, so first, I'm required by our general counsel to tell you that what I'm about to say is purely my opinion and not necessarily that of my employer, Mizuho Securities USA. Having said that, most of what I'm going to tell you is already published on their letterhead, so you make the decision. <laughs> um, 
so one of the factors that I think needs to be weighed in here is um, there, there's this phenomenon of once the companies start talking about consolidation of such a large scale and the potential upside from all of this consolidation, they get their shareholders very engaged and very excited. So I'll say once you go down that path, the final reason for these mergers is because their shareholders wanted it. Unfortunately for the shareholders, they got it because the stocks promptly went down. Um, but I, I would just, as a highlight, say that you know when you're dealing with for-profit publicly traded companies, don't underestimate the impact of the very fact that they're a publicly traded company with a responsibility, fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders, to undertake transactions and strategies that, you know, may at the end of the day um, not be as. Um, optimal as they would have started out to be. You know, when you have companies negotiating with each other or fighting with each other over an asset in the press, it does tend to raise the price to significant levels above where they would have otherwise been. So um, that that's part of the role. The, the other thing is I, I'm intrigued by uh, Anna's uh, comment about provider consolidation. One of the things we're not seeing is consolidation among the large, not for, the large for-profit hospital companies. You're seeing some off, one off acquisitions, but if anything, you're seeing separation with community trying to split into two companies rather than consolidation. You're seeing it one, you know, onesies, twosies in the marketplaces because all healthcare is local. Um, but I, I do think that there is an argument um, that the health plans would very much like to make, and as you might suspect, I cover more providers than I do plans, although I do cover both. Um, that they would like to make, which is that they need leverage in negotiating rates with hospitals because hospital rates are, are the big burr in the side of the health plans. And in order to do that, um, you have to develop local market scale, not just national market scale, because all health care, again, is local. And so one of the factors may be sort of behind the scenes, the monopsony power of these acquisitions that they might create in local markets and uh, to create networks that will serve the enhanced Medicare Advantage, the growing Medicaid managed care, um, and the still strong, although you know, complex and changing commercial market. Uh, that's something that I, I think is, is a secondary thought, part of the thought process initially, but may ultimately be where the battleground is. Yeah, yeah Jim. Uh, you put me on it. Yeah, and along those lines, I, uh, unlike the for-profit space, we're seeing a lot of mergers and acquisitions in the not-for-profit space, and I think um, the insurance consolidation is just going to be another thing that's driving that. I think what we've seen is that the not-for-profits generally, they've been very fragmented, and so the M&A, uh, the movement towards more strategic M&A has been for two reasons. To to gain efficiencies of scale, which they've never had. And then also the idea that we're moving towards risk-based, population uh, health-based reimbursement. They've got to have the size and scale, which, um, as, as Matt was saying, on the provider side, they, they weren't able to do that in the 90s because of the fractured nature of the, of the hospital market. And so I think you're seeing the not-for-profits realizing that and strategically understanding that they need to come together for efficiency to enter into these population health uh, reimbursement models. And I would say lastly, uh, although it's probably not said, it's to gain leverage in terms of their, their provide, uh, insurance negotiations, their rate, rate negotiations. Yes, it's possible the Affordable Care Act is as much a catalyst as a driver, given the things that have come up. Uh, let me ask the panelists, uh, assuming these mergers are approved, uh, perhaps with some divestitures required, um, will insurance purchasers uh, pay more or less for health insurance as a result? I can take that again if you like. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll start, and then let's see what the others think. Um, you know, I'm, I'm biased in favor of the the mergers actually going through. Uh, the medical loss ratio floors that I alluded to earlier have been an enormous burden, I think, um, on, on these companies. And as a consequence, the medical underwriting margin that, that they can earn and the return on capital does tend to get fairly limited. We've seen that now in the commercial markets in 2011. We have this now in the, in the Medicare uh, Advantage market starting 2014. Uh, the Medicaid markets already have that at the state level. There is a federal regulation that's in play at the moment and um, needs to be finalized by CMS. 
the scale, in, in my view, will give them the ability to some degree, as my uh, co-panelists have talked about, to negotiate better with the, the provider side of the house, manage utilization better through value-based care um, and other uh, approaches, but also fix cost leverage, really, and fixed uh, cost efficiencies. It's, it's mainly a kind of a GNA story, I think, uh, that they can enjoy or take to the bottom line. The rest of it, because of the loss ratio floors, they need to use that to a large degree just to gain share, but the, you know, the margin uh, capabilities are fairly limited. Um, secondly, I think they're moving more and more from a commercial employer-sponsored market uh, marketplace to a Medicare and Medicaid marketplace. On the Medicaid side of the house, I mean, the state Medicaid um, agency has so much um, buyer power that frequently these companies are dealing with at least 12 months of losses in any new contract. So I, I really don't, you know, sort of see how a merger is going to make that um, any any different because they're not they hardly have any negotiating power whatsoever. And again, on the Medicare side, the rates are set at the outset in, in February and in April on a, on a preliminary and final basis. And then they get to tweak their benefit design within you know, a box of different parameters that they have to negotiate with CMS. So you know, again, I, I really don't see how this will drive, up their, drive down their uh, medical loss ratios or increase their margins on the medical side. And it should help consumers. Yes. Matt? <clears throat> no, I, I just to, just to add to that. Um, I mean, I, I think the answer is we don't know. We we may never know. Um, what, uh, on the one hand, I agree with with Anna that uh, that there's definitely uh, cost economies of scale efficiencies that over time presumably will work their way into prices. On the other hand. Um, it, it's hard to, to, to see that concentration in markets uh, won't have some effect on the prices that groups and individuals are paying as well. Um, which one will outweigh the other is hard to say. In terms of the impact of regulation on pricing, whether it's uh, from the MLR floors or from rate regulation, uh, you, my observation there, you know, regulation is rarely as efficient as competitive pricing as a mechanism for you know, finding the, the right place for price. It's not yet clear what impact the MLR floors are going to have on insurance pricing over time. It does seem that the MLR floors have um, led to more stability in margins across the industry. Uh, whether that's generated net savings for consumers remains to be seen, but you know, maybe maybe that reduction of volatility in of itself uh, is a good thing. L my last point on the, the the concentration when we think of it from the purchaser side, I would agree with Anna's point about Medicaid. Um, it, it, it isn't clear; it's a little less clear in my mind on Medicare Advantage. You think about Medicare Advantage and the concentration that we have in that program, it's not entirely clear who has the leverage there. Is it uh, the federal government or is it the carriers you know, where you know, three of them together have more than 50% share uh, with the ability to change benefits year to year on a um, politically sensitive population? So again, let me take a crack at this. Um, I'm going to make an observation that may sound um, naive and cynical, but as a former antitrust economist, I can't imagine a merger of two powerhouses in a market not resulting in a higher price. It's, it's just pure common sense. Okay, so that's where I come from. But, 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 it's a higher, that's a question mark in a highly regulated industry. Um, and this is. What I'll say is, I think, Matt, you, were, you, you nailed it. We're not sure. We may never actually know. And the reason is, let's just go back to the basics of how a rational health plan sets price. They set their price equal to their cost trend. Their cost trend is rising. Therefore, price will rise. Whether it's coming from these mergers or not, prices are rising because cost trend is, is rising. You know, if you've been paying attention to the press, specialty pharmaceutical costs are rising really, really fast, and sometimes for some interesting reasons. So 
that may actually be resolved and that may take some pressure off cost trend in the next year or two and we may actually see some abatement. Will, building efficiencies in local markets, will getting better leverage, negotiating with high market share um, healthcare providers who are increasingly incentivized to become vertically integrated, whether physically or virtually, um, and build their own market share um, and market power, will that result in a lower cost trend that will allow reduced premiums or lower growth rates in premiums, which is more likely as a result of these mergers? Theoretically, it could. Practically, you won't see it just because cost trend is rising. You'll never see it. Well, I kind of agree. I think Matt hit the, hit the nail on the head in terms of the leverage against the federal government as you see this consolidation both in the provider space and in the insurer space because I think you're going to see the providers and the insurers, particularly on the MA side, their, their incentives are becoming more aligned. Obviously, they're going to have there's going to be that friction, but um, in terms of medical costs rising in ter and going back to the federal government and, and getting relief there, I think that that increases the leverage. But they've already do gotten that. I mean, every time CMS has tried to price <laughs> in a physician fee cut in the bad old days, you know, the industry went to Congress and said, mm -mm, mm -hmm. not going to take it. You know you're going to fix it, so do something about it. I mean, that's just one example of the kind of leverage that you all are talking about, which is interesting. Normally, we think of um, the industry, the healthcare industry, as a recipient and price taker in a government negotiations, but in, in this case, it's a really interesting point. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think one thing that's different in Medicare Advantage is that since the what hospitals and physicians get paid is pretty much regulated and, mm -hmm. and not really subject to market forces, is that the uh, you know, the provider payer leverage doesn't really come into play. It's just, as you say, the, uh, the payer government leverage. Well, I, I actually disagree that because you participate in a network under which you take Medicare, as a provider, you take Medicare Advantage patients, but that's as a result of a negotiation with the health plan. The range around it is much more limited than in a commercial negotiation. Because well, of the range, I would say, in the MA, yeah. on the MA side. I mean, I think it's very limited because if a uh, hospital is out of the network, uh, the hospital and the patient goes there, the hospital can't get paid anymore. So, so that's what I mean by regulated, mm -hmm. that they pay Medicare rates. And it's finally been researched. It's come out on that. Just a final you know, point. I just want to, to kind of a counterpoint to, to Jim and Matt's um, assertions around Medicare. Matt, Medicare, Matt is a famous bear and I'm a bull, so we obviously are on two ends of the spectrum here. Um, but for the last five years, the companies have seen an unbelievable amount of reimbursement reduction. And you can see this from their statutory filings. Companies like United Health have seen a tremendous amount of margin compression, as has seen you know, of Cigna, which bought supposedly the best of breed asset and now are operating at fairly like less than half the margin that, that HealthSpring had at one time. And so I, I really would disagree with this point of view that, um, that the, the leverage is in favor of the industry relative to, to CMS here. I think mm -hmm. that clearly the seniors come into play. I, I agree with that point and it's a politically sensitive um, and a very, you know, re relatively powerful political constituency. But at the end of the day, I think neither CMS nor the industry in this negotiation come out feeling like they won. It, you know, the Medicare was overpaid advantage at one point in time, and we've seen those payments uh, come in to a large degree. And now I think it feels to me, sitting where we sit, and you, you know, you all have to tell us whether that's fair, that the pushback from uh, the, the Democratic, you know, the, the side of the House has been less because they're not over earning anymore. They clearly were at one point in time. Could, could I just, uh, <laughs> and actually, I, I don't disagree with, with what Anna said. Um, uh, the you know it's been a, a, a leverage dynamic between the federal mm -hmm. government <clears throat> and the Medicare Advantage plans. If you go back to the time when the ACA was passed, and you recall the uh, then head actuary at CMS, Richard Foster, had projected that Medicare Advantage enrollment would decline by 30 percent by 2016 as a result of the the, the provisions in the Affordable Care Act. And I think, you know, based on everything that he was looking at at that time, that actually wasn't such a crazy projection. 
uh, you know, g g given the scheduled impact of the provisions in the ACA, combined with what at that time probably seemed like the most reasonable projections for underlying medical cost trend. As we went along, what happened was, I think the Obama administration discovered that they really, uh, they really could not uh, politically allow uh, that type of impact on the MA program, and so they introduced a number of measures that we all saw relative to MA reimbursement that effectively offset large, to a large degree, uh, you know, the provisions that were scheduled to come through in the ACA, such as the uh, star bonus demonstration project from 2012 to 2014, and of course, famously, the addition of the, the, the doc fix to the MA rates going into 2014. And then finally, what you had, um, I would just say, uh, in terms of uh, uh, keeping the MA program out of danger or out of maybe some of the danger it would have been in was how unprecedented the slowdown was in underlying Medicare uh, medical cost trend took some of the pressure off as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I better move on. Um, got some questions about provider le and plan leverage. I think we've covered some of it. I'm going to go specifically into the fact that we've seen many examples in both the brand and generic drug space of manufacturers acquiring a drug and then raising the price sharply. And I want to ask, is this a reflection of greater leverage for manufacturers, perhaps due to the expansion of insurance coverage, including Medicare Part D, uh, the ACA, and applicability of out-of-pocket maximums? Or is it something that was an opportunity that was always there and somebody just discovered it? I'll be happy to start with that one. So I don't cover the specialty pharmaceutical space, but I am the director of research for MSUSA, and one of my analysts, Irina Koffler, does. So um, I'm, I'm going to take some liberty with her views, which are our, our, our firm's view, as related by me and my personal opinion. <laughs> Boy, my lawyer would be so happy with me. Um, so so here, here's, here's a take. First of all, um, you know, you've got a bunch of good capitalists running these companies, and when they see an opportunity to use an alternate, alternative channel in order to distribute, um, you know, certain kinds of drugs, um, be they really mission-critical drugs or be they lifestyle or, or lifestyle-enhancing drugs, for example, in the derm dermatology channel, um, they're going to go after that. And there clearly was an opportunity to um, go around uh, some of the formulary restrictions and the structures set up by PBMs because we see evidence of it. And we see extensive evidence of it. And we see it having been extremely successful. Um, you know, is there an incentive for these guys as a result of regulation to do it? I don't think they needed any more incentive than the incentive that they had, which was that there was, there was a market-based opportunity that the market would bear these prices. And in particular, they did it by the good old-fashioned healthcare strategy of insulating the consumer from the true cost of the drug. Mm -hmm. So you go in, you want your brand name for toenail fungus, and guess what? You get it for free, or you get it with a $10 copay. Never mind that your health plan somehow is charged $1,000 for it, you know, with a gross margin that is, you know, probably close to 90% on it. Um, so very, very profitable. Now, having said that, um, you know, they have to be very, very careful with Medicare because the manufacturers are not allowed to buy down copays with Medicare. And if you've been following all of the stories about Valiant and Philidor in the press, what you saw is they took, they, they went to very great lengths on their conference calls to be very specific <clears throat> that they had controls around whether or not any of these copay buy-downs were ever offered or given, more importantly given, to any Medicare beneficiary. Um, how they did that without actually controlling Philidor is beyond me. They'll have to answer that one, I suspect, in court, but, and certainly in front of Congress. Uh, but for, you know, for the record, Valiant is saying that they didn't give it to Medicare. So I, I don't think specifically that it was related to um, the Medicare Advantage. Um, Medicare Part D um, is essentially Medicare Advantage um, together. Um, same, same issue. Um, on the ACA side, um, I think there was some um, acceleration, shall we say, of access to these kinds of drugs. Um, my sense, though, is that there's not a whole lot of data on whether the newly insured ran out and got toenail fungus medication. I think they were more likely to run out to the emergency room to get more critical issues addressed that had been chronic, because we know that the 
there was some adverse selection in the first go round and et cetera, that there were real, you know, more, shall we say, uh, acute or critical healthcare issues to address than some of these more lifestyle or longer term kind of chronic disease uh, diseases that would be affected by some of the drugs that are most famously known for some of this uh, um, pricing behavior. Um, but nevertheless, more coverage breeds more opportunity to buy down copays with jacked up prices on prescription drugs, and that's just reality. Um, so I, I think it was a number of things, but the primary thing was there was a, a pricing umbrella, there was a mechanism insulating the consumer from the real the true cost of healthcare, and they were extraordinarily adept at finding a way to do that. So this was an example of innovation. Mostly. Absolutely, <laughs> if you could call it innovation, it's not always necessarily the kind of innovation we might like to see from a policy perspective, from, but from a stock market perspective, it was a great run. That's right. Is Wall Street anticipating federal action to address this? Well, if they weren't, they sure are now. Um, so I, I, let me just handle that for a second, and then I'll, I'll see the floor. Um, when the first bomb was dropped with Shkreli, I guess his name, whatever, um, with the first one, sorry, I can't pronounce his name, I tried, I don't want to butcher it. Um, and with the first one coming out, when that, that first sailed over, you know, the, the traders monitors and into their, their sight of vision, which lasts about two split seconds, it was, okay, this is just a fluke. And then when the second wave came and Bernie Sanders and Elijah Cummings said, hey, we want to bring these guys in, in front of Congress, there was another wave of uh-oh. And then when the third thing happened, which was Hillary's tweet, and by golly, she's got a tiger by the tail with this one, you know, every time she tweets now, these stocks have heart failure. <laughs> by that time, the question was, no, it's true. By that time, the question was, you know, could this be real? Could they do anything? Does this have any legs? Now, after 27 years of dealing with scandals in healthcare, because, you know, that's sort of the, the meat potatoes of what I live for, um, and after 27 years of dealing with this, the answer is absolutely this has legs. First of all, tremendous consumer Main Street appeal. Those bad guys, they're gouging me. Second, election year politics. Come on, this is a brilliant, perfect topic to be talking about. There is no way a politician loses by going after these guys. Third, on top of that, we've now managed to box off Valiant and to a lesser extent Horizon, um, which seems not to have been doing the same things as Valiant, but maybe using the same channel. And some of the others that have been using the specialty pharmacy channel which is a legitimate channel, by the way. Um, we've been able to box those off, so there's not the, the issue that if a politician champions this notion on behalf of consumers and health plans and hospitals who have to pay these outrageous prices, that they'll lose funding from Big Pharma someplace else because they've done a nice job of isolating it to a few bad actors. There was no way this didn't have legs. And then the next wave was, well, it may have legs, but there'll never be congressional hearings. Last, yesterday, GOP finally agrees and the Oversight Committee will hold hearings. How could they not agree? It's political suicide not to agree in an election year to investigate what's clearly a bad actor alleged behavior. It's a no-brainer. This thing has legs, it's going through the election year, it's not going away, and by the time we're done, we may actually get some real savings out of it. If we don't, it would be a real pity and waste of resources. Thanks. Let me move on to the uh, marketplaces set up by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I've seen some research that Matt published recently showing large losses for many of the nonprofit blue plans in their public marketplace business. So I want to ask what are the key factors driving the losses and what does it mean for the future? Well, Paul, I, I, I think, I mean, we, we can't on, a, on the basis of the quarterly filings determine you know, all of the drivers uh, sure. product by product. But we can look at the loss ratios by product to some degree at least. And clearly, and this is also based on the public statements of many of the uh, non-public plans, is you know, supplemented by recent commentary from the public companies, the ACA exchanges have been um, a huge driver of, of losses across the industry. Not every single plan, some plans have 
and some even some not for profits have, have like Wellmark famously have stayed out of the uh, ACA exchanges, but most have been in and most have su suffered considerable losses. Um, it, whereas the results in the core non ACA group commercial business have been much more steady and have helped to, you know, I mean, we, we, those companies would really be in a hard place if, if, um, if that business wasn't uh, running, if not really well, at least at a fairly uh, stable level. But I would, though, add to that that there seems to have been some pressure on Medicare Advantage as well, for, again, for the not-for-profit companies, uh, but, but most of it from the ACA exchanges. I guess, uh, you know, I, I, again, it's hard to say from the staff filings what really is exactly the driver, but Sonia, you know, we can have opinions on, on what it likely is, and we do talk to the companies that we cover as to what they see the drivers uh, likely to be. So firstly, clearly in 2014, we were expecting, and as it happens, the first comers are the ones with pre-existing conditions, so you have adverse selection on exchange. The exchanges have very stringent rate review, and as a consequence, they're not entirely able to absorb all the losses that they're, they're generating with all these um, sick comers that are overutilizing on you know, procedures and services without kind of a balanced um, risk pool, if you will. The three R's, as, as everybody has hoped and expected, with the reinsurance, the risk corridors, and the risk adjusters, we're supposed to and are supposed to be the early backstop on, on the losses. Reinsurance seems to have come through clearly for 2014, so far so good, and without that, the losses would have been even uh, much worse than they are today. Risk corridors, unfortunately, as we got into the end of September, CMS at this point has only paid out 12% of the total claimed risk corridors, and that has sent a bunch of co-ops out of business, but has not left the publicly traded insurers unscathed. In fact, Humana is now in the second year of tremendous losses on, on exchange. Um, they've been trying to subsidize some of those losses with the Medicare Advantage book, and uh, you know, some speculate that maybe that they would not have had to sell the company had they not been in, in such a bad position where they're seeing 15% of their earnings being uh, lost by you know within the exchanges and are not sure if they reach break even um, next year as well. Finally, and I think this is really a troubling trend, um, in the third quarter of, of this um, year, we started to see both the managed care companies complaining a lot about attrition in the marketplaces um, because they're saying the persistency of the consumers is very low. They come in for one, two, three months and pay premiums get a lot of procedures and services delivered and then they're dropping off either because the premium subsidies are not adequate or the cost sharing subsidies are not adequate and the out of pocket cost bearing the sticker shock is enormous. On the hospital side, we're seeing a very troubling rise in the uncompensated care. All of, you know, it's been happening slowly. HCA, the bellwether reported that in the second quarter, very worrisome. In the, sec in the third quarter, we had some of their peers saying the same thing. They're not entirely saying it's because of exchange attrition, but if you try to kind of connect the dots across the two spaces we cover, seems like it's a fairly big driver of what's going on. And what that means for 2016, will we get the, you know, will the stick work on the individual mandate to get younger and healthier people in, and will they be sticky enough through the remainder of the year? I think it remains to be seen. Okay. Did Jim, did you want to speak? No. Okay, uh, you covered a lot of that. That was good. Um, let's talk a little bit about the co uh, collapses. And I uh, just want to ask you, you know, the, uh, what are the most important factors behind the collapse of some of the co-ops and, and how much of it has to do with inevitable barriers to new market entrants that are competing with large established insurers or have, have have the risk corridor issues been more important? Uh, it was a quote I wrote down from my former colleague, Deborah Chalet of Mathematica. Uh, and the quote was about how over the past 20 to 25 years, all of the entry into health insurance markets by major insurers has involved in acquiring an existing plan rather than starting a plan from scratch as co-ops are trying to do. So any perspective on uh, what's the most important reason behind the failures of so many of the co-ops. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think that uh, partly it can be maybe largely attributed to uh, the circumstances around the launch of the exchanges because the co-ops were oriented almost exclusively on the exchange business, which you know initially by most carriers, whether they had experience or not, um, with some exceptions, was was priced too low to begin with, and then. And then you had the compounding factor, the Obama administration's 11th hour decisions to allow grandmothering and versions of keep what you have, uh, which arguably uh, led to some, uh, some, some worsening dynamics for the risk pool, and that made the pricing even less adequate. And then finally, as it's turned out, um, the risk corridors uh, have been uh, woefully underfunded. Uh, and, and that's maybe the third uh, prong in this. But also, I think more broadly with respect to the co-ops didn't really have a lot to offer from the get-go. I mean, if you think about the co-ops as compared to, say, some of the new provider-sponsored plans, the provider-sponsored plans uh, have, have emerged with you know, their own assets, their own delivery system as something unique that they're offering. The co-ops didn't really have an edge of any sort um, on which they could could gain share, except perhaps uh, by virtue of the fact that they were not for profit. And then you consider the nature of the barriers to entry uh, in this industry, which I would argue are more in the form of the uh, difficulty of replicating the network arrangements and the network pricing that established carriers have. I think that is the number one reason uh, for the dynamic that you referenced, Paul, where there, there really isn't any, uh, with the exception, of course, of the co-ops, there, there really, you don't see organic uh, market expansion, organic market entry, because it is so difficult uh, to bring competitive pricing to the table. And the irony for the providers is that, uh, you know, while on the one hand they may complain about the uh, lack of competition among health insurers, uh, you know, to a certain degree they're, they're responsible for maintaining the biggest barrier to entry uh, in the form of the advantageous pricing they give to the larger carriers. Did you have something? Yeah, actually, you know, one thing I was sitting is probably be a, a great study, which perhaps is done, but I haven't seen it, of just looking at uh, the relative increases in marketplace prices from 2015 to 2016 in different states and seeing how large a role that state's grandfathering, grandmothering policies can explain that. Because uh, I just do recall an anecdote that California has had a very small rate of increase in 2016. That state did not allow the grandfathering, grandmothering, and that may be the, uh, the payoff for it. Yeah, but I, I don't want people to lose sight of, of what Matt said, which was the underpricing of the product in the first year. I mean, that when I was last here, here the year before last, and, you know, we had Carl McDonald here, Matthew Borsch here, and Cheryl Skolnick there, and I learned a lot. <coughs> and so, you know, one of the, the things that you two were discussing was just how big a rate, and, and, and discussing with some enthusiasm, how big a rate, you know, jump from current commercial rates these folks would have to put in place in order to make money on the exchanges. And I think the numbers were at least 15 percent, if not more than that. And that's not what we saw. And then the other issue that just as, as I'd sort of throw out there as question or, or not, just to a point, by the time these folks had to figure out what their second year bids were, they only had a couple of months of experience with the first year. And we talked about that then too, that, that the rate setting for 15 was not based on a full year of experience. These guys are insurance companies. If you don't have claims experience, it's really hard to be actuarially sound in pricing your policy for the next year. One of the things United said on its most recent call was that they felt pretty good about their 15 and 16, more likely 16 rates um, on the exchange because they had started to see studies of just how underpriced product was, how high utilization rates were relative to premium 
in the exchange product just before they submitted their bid and they goosed it up. Um, and if you didn't do that, if you weren't you know, able to see that, then you're gonna have yet another year of losses. And, and I think that that's a level of sophistication the co-ops may not have had. Good point. Let me move on to the spending trend outlook. And you know, we've had years of relatively low spending trends, particularly in Medicare. Uh, and this has triggered an extensive debate about the relative importance of the recession and its slow recovery versus other factors that may prove more durable. So from your perspective, what are the key factors behind the last few years of relatively low spending trends? And then what's your outlook for the next five years? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, at least from my point of view. So I, as you, I think what you say is, is you know, very telling in a way is because you, you're seeing this moderation in spending in the Medicare side of the house. And granted, there's, you know, with even fixed income seniors may see a little bit of pressure um, in during a recession because there is, a, you know, at least a little bit of out-of-pocket spend. Though once you have, if you are on a Medicare supplement policy, you, you're kind of, you know, pretty much covered there. But the fact that you are seeing the slowdown in Medicare as well as in commercial, at least I believe that tells you that a portion of this is because of more durable structural factors than just the recession. Um, I think on the Medicare side, we've seen a huge increase in uh, the adoption of Medicare Advantage. And you know whether or not one is in favor of the program, these are largely companies that are profit motivated. And then we know that it's largely concentrated among publicly traded companies. It's gone from one in six to almost one in three uh, people, seniors today, that have MA. And they are much tighter at managing um, cost trends. They're dealing with reimbursement reductions. They're dealing with medical loss ratio floors. And they've been moving their product increasingly from PPO, which is more open network, to, to HMO. So I think all of those are fairly durable factors and, and should persist for, for a bit. As far as the commercial side, I'm sure a portion of it is related to the recession. Um, are, you know, at this point, you can see the trend or cost trend is kind of bottomed on the commercial side. The, the plans are anticipating very small upticks of 25 to 50 bips. I don't think we'll get back to the seven and a half, eight percent type trend that we had in 2007 before the recession. You probably end up somewhere, I think, in the six-ish percent range, and it will remain persistently down as you have more out-of-pocket increases with high deductible health plans and a shift to, to value-based care also starting to percolate into, into commercial. <clears throat> I, if I could, yeah, I, yeah. I agree with um, Anna's forecast there, adopted as my own now. <laughs> but, uh, um, my I, I would maybe put a, put a little bit more <laughs> emphasis on the impact of the recession. Uh, if, you, you know, if you look back at the way cost trends behaved on the downside, you really saw uh, trends fall off a cliff in 2010, and it happened across commercial Medicare and even Medicaid to a large degree, um, which, you know, I think given the timing, you can reasonably attribute most of that to the aftermath of the, of the Great Recession. Um, that happened a little more abruptly and more suddenly than we see in past economic cycles, but you've seen this trend in economic cycles in the past, at least going back to the 1980s, if not the, 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 a little bit earlier than that. Um, and I think what you're seeing now is some gradual petering out of that recessionary impact, and, and, that, and that's leading to gradually rising trend in, in commercial and in Medicare, um, really more utilization demand, if you will. And, and maybe it's counterintuitive that that's occurring in Medicare given uh, that there is a lot less cost sharing there. But you know, there's even some academic evidence for uh, a cyclical pattern to care seeking in single payer countries. Um, and, and there is actually cost sharing in Medicare, so it makes some sense that we would be seeing that. The, the last thing I'd say on this is um, you relative to where medical cost trend can go, and the reason uh, that I agree with Anna on that is I just don't think that there is, um, I just don't think we have the resources, payers don't have the resources to uh, absorb trend 
going up to a double digit level, for example. I also think that some of the, the utilization of services, at least with the existing medical technology that they have that we have today, is is pretty saturated. So I'm not sure where that would come from unless it's from um, you know, and this could be the answer, uh, innovations, uh, new innovations that we have yet to see in, in biotech or, or other uh, areas of healthcare. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, again, I'm going to look at it from maybe the bottom up instead of the top down. One of the major things that happened from 2008 through today is um, the shift from inpatient to outpatient care across all payers, um, f you know, otherwise known as observations. Uh, so essentially pr um, delivering the same care but getting paid a fraction of what you were getting paid before. If that hasn't had a positive impact on um, cost trends, meaning pushing it down, I don't know what is, and that would go across the board. So by the way, um, if you have Cigna and you need a hysterectomy, it's a 23-hour stay, it's an outpatient procedure if it's done robotically, you don't even need to ask mother may I. And you want to know why trend is under management? Because we have the technology, we have the innovation, and the payment just gets slashed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really rather rather amazing. It, it's and and on top of that, the pain management is such they literally can make you very happy to go home in 23 hours. That 24th hour is a killer, but at 23, you're rolling out the door. You're happy as can be. Okay, so you know there's a cost in in terms of of patient care or, or feeling, but they're very, very effective, managed care and Medicare, in putting payment incentives in place now, otherwise known as rate cuts, by saying, no, it's not an inpatient case anymore, it's outpatient. Um, if you look at what some of the companies have done, like Tenet, you know, committing significant amount of capital to get into the outpatient business, the not-for-profits have been leading that charge for a long time, getting into the, you know, primary care businesses and getting into everything that is outpatient because they understand that outpatient is where things are being shifted to. The other thing that's happening now, you know, right away, I would say, is... Um, we're seeing a faster and and broad, faster pace of change, but broader kinds of changes in acute care reimbursement, which you know, as as Paul said, is now a lot of money. We're ta spending a trillion dollars. We need to control that. So, it's a very significant um, effort on the part of entities like an Optum, which is part of United, but not exclusively, like the Innovation Center at CMS but not exclusively, you know, across the board, trying to find ways of reducing spend to the absolutely minimum necessary level and getting patients out of the hospital, which has significant implications here. And that's where I think the opportunity is. It's moving hospitals from filling beds to treating patients. And if you can do that, you'll, get, you'll crack the code on the next part of that trillion dollars that's going to get eaten away. Yeah, and I think on the uh, not-for-profit side, I think they've been able to absorb those cuts. So we've, you know, we've had a negative sector outlook and, and kind of expecting to see that impact, at least on the not-for-profit side. And we haven't seen that as much. And I, I go back to some of the trends. I think some of the mergers and acquisitions, and to be quite honest with you, I think the larger systems have just been able to operate more efficiently. I mean, if one of the... Um, uh, one of the criticisms on the not-for-profit side is that they don't operate as efficiently as the for-profits. Um, and there's some social issues on that, but they've got uh, strong balance sheets and you're also seeing lower leverage uh, because they're spending less on, on inpatient facilities. And so they're, they're able to adjust to that and they're, they're moving more quickly. And so from a profitability standpoint, we've actually seen pretty good uh, stability and profitability on the not-for-profit space. Yeah. Well, when you have the for-profits trying to integrate acquisitions they probably never should have made, <laughs> you're not going to see a whole lot of margin improvement and efficiency at the local hospital level. Yeah. Let's talk about specialty drugs. That uh, uh, Hepatitis C drugs stood out because the, uh, the number of patients who could benefit from them was so large. Uh, in contrast to so many other specialty drugs that came before. Um, do you see more uh, drugs like that coming down the pipeline for other conditions uh, to be compelling, or is this just kind of a, a unique uh, thing that uh, we shouldn't be projecting? Well, I think that there are some, not, I'm not a scientist, but just from what I see from the companies that we look at from a biotech and specialty pharmaceutical perspective, 
You know, there's some, some cancer treatments now that the AstraZeneca drug for lung cancer, for example, just got, it, just got approved, which could be a novel treatment. Um, there's some other things like that that are treating some pretty serious diseases. I think what was unique about hep C was the patient population with hep C was just so large mm -hmm. and omnipresent across all of the um, benefit beneficiaries among the publicly traded companies um, as well as, as the not-for-profits. So that it's just a, a, a broad disease as opposed to some of these narrower ones. But there's going to be- And it was a patient population that was basically inventory. Correct. As opposed to with cancer, you know, you'll do whatever you can when the cancer is That's diagnosed. That's right. That's correct. That's right. And so I, I think that, you know, innovation in pharmaceuticals is absolutely continuing. The high prices of specialty drugs when they are introduced of, of these true specialty drugs um, will persist. Um, and, you know, to some extent, at the first blush, the PBMs are going to have to deal with it. And then after that, they get smart and they get some interesting strategies to be able to kind of break the back of the pricing paradigm. If I could just add one more yeah. point to that. Um, and, and of course, the interesting thing about the hep C drugs is arguably, at least, those save money over time. That's I mean, right. that's yet that, to be that's, seen. That's right. But of course, it involves a very large, and in some, some ways, this was not fully expected, uh, upfront cost that can be a shock. Um, so you know, one of the questions is, you know, what type of innovation do we get? You know, very expensive cancer drugs that add, you know, three months to life expectancy, or something like these Hep C drugs that have a demonstrable impact. Yeah, well, let's get into what are the uh, PBMs and, and insurers doing to to address this issue. Um, I mean, I've seen that there's been. You know, we had an era of tiered formularies, and now we're seeing exclusive formularies more and more. Um, any other thoughts on, you know, what's going on and what we might see? I think, well, you know, on the hep C side, just to, to add a, another point to that, it was, it's been a, a large upfront population. It's been a cure, and it's a very short duration treatment with a limited uh, prevalence as opposed to a kind of a long-term treatment paradigm for a chronic disease such as cancer. So in some ways, I think the oncology issue is far more challenging. With hep C, there was uh, also you know, a bit of, uh, I guess, competition that came in at the last moment in the end of 2014 with Gilead and Savaldi and the AbV drug and the PBMs and the managed care companies that run captive PBMs got some relief out of it. On the oncology side, I think it's a much harder nut to crack because you could have a stable of, of new compounds that could be you know, life-saving and everybody wants access to them. Anthem has, I think, probably been most vocal and uh, open about the pilots that they're doing with the oncologists where there's a, a level of payment reform, if you will. There are upfront payments to oncologists based on the number of patients that they have in their practice that are fairly sizable and that uh, direct them to stay within certain specified pathways and you know the utilization is a little bit more monitored and it's an aligned incentive type of program. Um, on you know back to the Wall Street uh, fears around drug pricing, I think um, kind of a corollary to that is there's been some fear that not only might we have congressional action as the, the tweets from Hillary and, and others might uh, attest to, but CMS might get into more of a bundle payment uh, pilot approach for oncology that is not voluntary and that could put a lot of pressure as well. And you know, I think the Anthem approach and, and the CMS approach are, are, are ways to, to kind of control the utilization and maybe drive more you know, pressure on the drug companies that are coming up with great branded options. So Anthem, uh, excuse me, Optum just completed a five-year pilot of a new way to pay physicians. At the time they announced it, um, the payment for oncologists was combined with the price of the chemo drug. And they unbundled, and they paid for the chemo drug separately, and their chief medical officer was unfortunately quoted at the time, we're going to stop paying doctors to be drug pushers. Um, and um, as a result of that, the, they've completed the pilot. What they found was if you pay a doctor to spend time with their patient and actually treat their patient and manage their case, they do a really good job. Um, they found actually that oftentimes they, um, they, that sometimes they used a more expensive drug, but they used the more expensive drug more effectively. 
Um, and um, the cost savings from the program was at least 12%. I, I can't remember if it was 12 to 15%, but it was at least 12% over this period, and outcomes were better. So the patients ended up having better outcomes, longer progression fee for survival. Um, the costs were substantially lower, and this was because you pay doctors to do what doctors are supposed to do, and they're you know now drug independent. They can truly pick the the medication that works best for their patient. So um, you know as you start thinking about these bundled payment arrangements. You know, what I worry about more in terms of whether it's drug spend or any one of these things is those at unintended consequences of you think bundling is the answer for everything. It's not the answer for everything. You've got to be really careful to be precise, and make sure you understand what goal you want to achieve, which is a healthier patient who costs the system less money. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. The, uh, the USC Schaefer Center held a conference here on specialty drugs with the Hill uh, in early October. And I had planned a panel on uh, specialty drug uh, bundle payments and was really surprised in talking to the people who were going to be on the panel and then during it, the degree to which there is not, you know, the emphasis is, was not on putting the drugs in the bundle. And that large opportunities for savings in hospitalizations mm -hmm. exactly. were, were re actually what in some approaches of the different companies, that's what the big rewards were coming from. Um, are there other technologies besides specialty drugs that, are, that you're aware of that are coming down the pike that might be important as uh, leading to notably higher spending? I, I, for one, spend more of my time looking for new technologies that lead to notably lower spending. Okay, tell us about those. <laughs> um, because that's where I think we have to go, so I'm trying to figure out if, you know, whoever builds that mousetrap. Um, it, it's mostly in changing behavior as opposed to a technology. But a technology that is getting a lot of attention now is the richness of data that exists within not just managed care plans, but also large hospital systems. And the challenge that one has is most of this data is in natural language. Okay? It's, a doc, it's a patient record. It's a physician note. Um, and all of this data is kept. Even if it's scanned, you really can't do much about, with it. Um, with some innovations out in uh, the Valley, and Silicon Valley and in, you know, in, in data science, which is actually now a really big career in case anybody wants to change career and be really great demand, data scientists are in huge demand right now. Um, and, and there's this uh, language or process, I'm not sure what it is, um, it's I guess a combination of both called Hadoop, which allows you to do natural language processing extraordinarily efficiently and very quickly. So this is the enabling technology that's going to dramatically affect the cost of healthcare because now you have this big database that you can build of records and experience of how patients are treated, what, what actions lead to better outcomes, what actions lead to worse outcomes that you can now eventually implement as a next generation best practice so that you can use the analytics to change behavior to reduce cost. So that's where I see a lot of the innovation coming is from data, from analytics, as opposed to from clinical practice. Mm -hmm. and, well, and Cheryl, and just to build on a point you made there, which is um, also though the technology that's enabling more and more things to be done on an outpatient basis yes, outside of the hospital. Yes. Maybe you know, in many ways, that's process innovation is uh, more than technology. But that's that's clearly a source of it. Has been a source of innovation over the last decade, if not longer. Right, and part of that is the anesthesia, the improvements in anesthesia and pain management, mm -hmm. in um, and just our willingness to take the risk of not having a big operating room and emer you know, big emergency staff standing by while we have a minor procedure. Well, and Cheryl, I think the, the whole idea of interoperability, I mean, on the not-for-profit side, we see these large systems that have made substantial investments in Epic and Cerner, mm -hmm. which is great as long as you're within that network. But if you move outside that, that hospital network, you know, we've all heard those stories. We've got to go in and have imaging done and, and go through everything, you know, go through those same steps. How many procedures are done um, that don't need to be done or are redundant? And, 
you know, that's a, a hot button issue. I'm not sure where, you know, where we stand. I, I think some of the vendors obviously are, are pushing back on, on developing interoperability because sure, it serves their end. reasons. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's the gilded cage. If you're in it, it's happy, <laughs> but if you're not. Yeah. Uh, probably in about 15 minutes, we'll be taking our first break. So if you have questions, this would be time to start writing them down on the blue cards. Uh, what about labor costs? For providers, is this <laughs> is this an issue? Um, are wage rates going up? Are there serious shortages? Uh, so I'll take this. Well, whether there are or they're not, communities paid for it. Okay, their yeah. stock got whacked um, as their earnings collapsed, collapsed because they were the second person who said labor costs going up or wage pressures, not quite wage pressures, but labor costs causing an earnings miss. The first one was HCA. So. Uh, and then it was just stunning. All of a sudden, as soon as the conversation started, everyone sort of chimed in. And, and part of it is because when HCA and community pre-announce really bad news, everyone else knows they're going to get asked, so they might as well mention it, even if it's not a problem. And for some of the providers, it wasn't a problem. But clearly what we're beginning to see is that if it's not actual nursing wage pressures, it's physician, employed physician pressures where uh, the hospitals have gone out and uh, acquired a lot of practices, employed a lot of physicians, and those physicians aren't nearly as productive as you thought they would be, especially since inpatient admissions aren't going up. Um, and that's a whole other story. And then the second issue is that as you get economic recovery in some markets, you know, the, the nursing pool is a little bit older. Um, they tend to be second wage earners uh, in families, not exclusively, but one of the beauties of being a nurse is you can go in and out of the labor pool. And so we're beginning to see some signs in some hotter markets in Florida and some other places where the nursing pool is beginning to shrink. Um, on the other hand, um, a lot of what we saw in the quarter was self-inflicted wounds, um, where on the part of HCA, they didn't handle their graduate nurses who come on in May and June. Um, particularly well because they have to be oriented and trained and, and cuddled a bit um, to give them the confidence to go forward because they, they're a little hard to handle. Uh, <laughs> and we've seen this before. Actually, Tenet had that problem a number of years ago, and it's interesting that HCA is having it again now. So that's one issue. The other issue is if you have unexpectedly high volume, then you pay contract labor rates. Well, why do you pay contract labor rates? Because you have too many open positions. Why do you have too many open positions? Because you're not paying enough money. So at the end of the day, they can tell me it's company specific all they want. I find it very hard to believe that, you know, when you see this confluence of onesie, twosie factors, that we're not seeing the beginnings of an underlying trend of a tightening labor market, especially for nursing, and the inefficiency of owning physician practices on the other side um, weighing heavily on labor costs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot to add because I agree with most everything you said. I think on the not-for-profit side, you know, in the particularly in the Medicare, Medicaid expansion states, you've seen an increase in, in the need for nurses yeah, and staffing really, there, and really I think point. that that's had had an impact. You know, generally when we're talking to the not-for-profits, they kind of try and downplay that issue, but that's one of our bigger concerns going forward is that over the last few years, the ability to manage salary wages and benefit costs have been something that's been beneficial for the, for the sector. And I think that those wage pressures now are going are, are gonna to be more difficult to handle going forward. Yeah, it was usually helpful in 2009. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, this is an odd question I put here. But you know, we hear so much about wellness and you know, both from you know, many large companies about the potential of wellness, but also the, uh, uh, but also in a sense a lot of skepticism as to, you know, is this really a pipe dream? Um, and some research showing, well, if you're going to save money from wellness, you need to have a total company commitment and it's not easy. Um, do any of you have perspectives on uh, uh, whether uh, that's an, an area of opportunity for, say, employers? I think the jury's still out on that. Uh, the, the evidence, uh, to the extent that there is evidence, is mixed. Uh, but it, it does seem to point to, to what, um, what, what you just uh, cited, which is that in order to get strong results, a you know really strong company-wide effort is needed to move the needle, and it's not clear that 
um, th that that the majority of companies have the um, uh, ha have the the will or the resources um, to you know to to really engage in that type of company wide effort and the complications that that would bring. Good. Other thoughts on it. So the one company that did engage in, in wellness-oriented behavior was actually United, remember? Um, and they were in the fortunate circumstance of, first of all, being a managed care company and being able to experiment on their own employees, and they did it quite effectively and efficiently. But what worked for them, um, they reduced the employee's portion of next year premium by a couple hundred dollars a person for every person who achieved their health goals in the year. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing talks like money. <laughs> yeah, my sense is, is just that, is that the, the incentives, the financial incentives have never been great enough to really change behaviors. I just find it annoying. <laughs> <laughs>